a presentation of South Carolina ETV. Funds for the following program were provided by the literature programs of the National Endowment for the Arts and the New York State Council on the Arts, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Section 3, Reading Comprehension. Example. Most people do not know the interesting origins of Nabisco's Oreo cookie, one of the world's most eaten dessert snack biscuits. If people realized that it was invented by a wealthy Afro-American baker and leader of the pro-assimilation movement of the 1940s, they might think twice before unscrewing the chocolate wafers and eating the cream filling separately. The author probably believes that A. Whitey is the devil B. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. C. The already troubled black bourgeoisie is now in danger of assimilating itself to smithereens. Or D. The best things in life are free. Mi bucko, the best things in life are free. The correct answer is a matter of heated debate. the Upper West Side, New York City. It has been said that for a writer living in New York, the subject is everywhere. When Trey Ellis began his first novel, he set the book in Manhattan, where he has lived since 1978 in a Riverside Drive apartment that once belonged to his father. Platitudes is an experimental novel that incorporates elements such as menus, lists, computer printouts, and test questions. It is a story within a story about a 38-year-old writer named Duane and about the teenage protagonist Duane is writing about, Earl. Earl lifts a toast point Platitudes is also about stereotypes and cliches. When the novel was published in 1988, one critic described it as a wickedly funny antidote to such classics of the black experience as the color purple. William A. Ellis III was born in 1962 in Washington, D.C., the son of a psychiatrist, William Ellis II, and a lawyer, Pamela Ellis. Both his parents were college professors. Trey went to prep school at Phillips Academy in Andover, then went on to Stanford University, where he was editor of the student humor magazine. He wrote platitudes when he was 23 years old, working as a translator in Italy. I didn't want an autobiographical first novel, because I, I hate them. I didn't want a 22-year-old, 21-year-old, uh, post, recent post-grad, you know, who's trying to find his way through life. I wanted to pick someone different. So I picked a, a, a narrator who was maybe what I was afraid I'd become if I never sold a book, if, sort of a failing guy who thought he was too smart for the world, who was proofreading, as I was doing, but, you know, proofreading at 38 years old and, for, you know, some, really a loser but only because he thinks the world does not realize his genius. That's he's an arrogant loser. Um, and then the kid was what I was afraid that I was, which is an overweight, hardcore nerd, which is not, each one is, is sort of a characterization of what I was and what I'm afraid I would, would have become. And in the course of the novel, a black feminist author, is she, one of the main characters, is sending chapters to the author in the book, Dwayne, of how she thinks the book should be written. And those chapters are very much a parody of the black tradition, or at least a part of the black tradition in writing. Tell me how you came to satirize the black tradition. Uh, what I call the Afro-Baroque. I've always, I, I mean, as a kid, I love that stuff. I think that's why I think this, the parody works, um, because I don't despise it. So I'm, I'm a little sympathetic to it. Um, I mean, I loved Sounder as a kid. I would read all, you know, Maya Angelou and, and, and his different works, 
But then as I got a little older and I read sort of second and now 10th generation um, Afro-Baroque glory stories, as, as uh, Duane calls them, I just can't stand them anymore. And I think that we have so many, um, the black experience is so broad now that it's, it's, it's pandering for a lot of urban, upper middle class black writers to write pretending that they are from, uh, that they were born barefoot in a shack. Chapter three, going fishing. Earl and his two friends, Cornbread and Bassmouth, snuck out the back of that wise old church just as the congregation rose to greet the two new women. There, behind the shoulders of that bright, clean house of God, the three boys hid behind a tall, proud oak. God's oak, the simple, kind folk of Lowndes County called it. Then they scampered silently, crouched low, their poles nearly touching the ground, almost as if they knew that just six years later all three would be crouched low, silently scampering over a landscape not their own. Only this time the fishing poles would be rifles and the land would be Alsace. And instead of a friendly competition between the boys, the winner receiving a cherry coke, now they'd all be fighting in the second war to end all wars and no man would be the winner. And they ran, oh how they ran, the wind at their backs urging them forever forward and away, away from the misdirected self-hate of previous glorious generations. Now deep in that so sweet smelling woods they collapsed, out of breath, laughing. Shoot, Bassmouth, said Cornbread. If Laquita known how out of shape you is, she'd drop you like a hot potato. Don't you go holding your breath now, replied Bassmouth, because I know you got the sweet eye on her. That stringy old mule, he replied, well, I wouldn't touch your skinny yellow gal with a 10-foot fishing pole. You wish you had one, replied the other two in practice simultaneity. After the laughter died down to a quiet murmur of soft guffaws and huffs, Cornbread asked seriously, but Bassmouth, what's it really like? Earl held his breath. What's, what's what like, little boy? Laughed Bassmouth. You know darn well what he's talking about, stammered Earl. Bassmouth then sucked his teeth, hooked his thumbs and his belt loops, took a deep breath and threw out his chest. Oh, he began expansively. It's hard to get at, but once you get it, it's mighty fun. What do you mean hard to, hard to get at, asked Earl tentatively. What I mean is that if they don't want to give it up, you just gotta take it. But they likes it better that way anyway. Besides, you can usually trick them into doing it, anything you want. Bassmouth belched. Like what? asked Cornbread, surprised. Well, let's say she says she don't want to because she knows you're just going to skiddle on her and the baby and she'll be all alone with that young in the lounge while you's over in Memphis or someplace with them three dollar whores or up north all rich and fat and she'll be on relief all her life till she die. Well, if she ups and says all that jibbity pie, you just tell her a big old bumblebee done stung your weenie wanker and killed all your sap. Bassman laughed and laughed his face twisted into a hideous death mask of ugly stupidity as the other two hesitantly chuckled, just vaguely understanding through the near impenetrable cloud of youthful hormonal ignorance that something just might be amiss. And when you started parodying this Afro-Baroque style, as you call it, did you start clicking off what the elements of that were going to be? You know, strong maternal figures, uh, the rural South, etc. Yeah, I don't know what I did. I mean, I think it started off, I was in class, um, and the, this fiction writing class, and uh, a friend of mine, another, a black, the other black guy in the class was writing much more in this other style. Um, so I sort of, but you know, writing, well, he's a good writer, and he's writing in this other style, and I was thinking, that's, it's so different from my style. It would be funny to just have bring in a letter from this woman. So the first letter was one of the first things I'd, I'd written that. I wrote that, I think, in the second week of class. Um, her first letter, Dear Freak, What Genius of Disturbed, DT in the News, etc. Um, then, uh, then I've had her, just the first paragraph of her section, you know, funky smelling lovemaking. That's one of the first things I wrote. Um, and people really liked it. And I said, I liked it too. And I said, people, people really wanted to hear more of this. And I said, I love, I mean, it was so easy to write. It just really, there was like a vein in, in my brain that just, I could, I could write like that, like is she forever. Um, but I had never read 
books. I never read The Color Purple. I never read, uh, I mean, really that much purple prose. I had not, not read. Um, I, I made it up. But I'd seen enough, you know, in terms of movies and, and books, you know, you know what you're talking about. You know there's going to be a preacher. You know the, women are, the older women are going to be heavy and kind. And, you know, everyone's going to be barefoot. Uh, the men are not are going to be rotten. No, we women of color do not need your atavistic brand of representation, thank you. Signed, is she? I am. P.S. Here's how you should have commenced your work. Chapter 1. Rejoice. Earl awakened to a day as new and as fresh as Mama's hand-starched and sun-dried petticoat. A huge, plain garment as large and as fresh-smelling as the revival tents that bloomed every summer along Route 49 in Lowndes County, Georgia. Yes, from out of those wide Baptist thighs, thighs that shook with the centuries of injustice and degradation, thighs that twitched with the hope of generations yet unplanted, thighs that quivered with the friction of jubilant bed thumping and funky smelling lovemaking, <laughs> emerged Earl. Yes, Earl pulled his lanky but still growing arms and legs out of that big old bed, from out of which, just 16 years before, his mama had screamed and squeezed him to life. The old gray and white striped but fresh washed and feather filled pillows of Mama, Maylene, Nadine, and Lurleen still bore the hills and valleys of well needed use, though the makers of those hills and valleys had long since been lifted triumphantly to begin yet another grueling day of women chores, back breaking and unrewarding save for that inner God inspired knowledge that someday the gates of heaven will finally open up for me. Yes. Earl stumbled off to that weathered but jubilant and noble handmade cedar outhouse, and as he smeared his adolescent buttock on the weathered gray and white freckled iron seat with 1928 World's Fair Progress for Peace emblazoned on both its face and its underbelly, Earl rolled his eyeballs down Route 49, as he did every morning, vainly searching for the gin-reeking silhouette of his father, who had thumbed his way out of Lowndes County that drizzly autumn morning two years before, when Mama triumphantly proclaimed to the family, waving Earl's just nocturnally weighted and fecund smelling underpants high above her head and the heads of the jubilant, strong-willed daughters, he's a man. Good God, he's loaded. <laughs> Whale drawled his father coolly as he slung his other pair of coveralls over a shoulder once bitten by Natchez Floozy. Two men in this family be one man too many. And with that, that disgrace, slouched north to the land of gambling, drinking and fine light women. If you're consciously trying to break with past traditions, why bring up race at all in a novel? It depends what tradition you're talking about. I mean, the tradition of uh, Ishmael Reed and Clarence Major and Ralph Ellison, um, I'm very, and Charles Johnson, I'm very much wanted to be a, wanted to be a part of. John A. Williams, um, Toni Morrison. I think that uh, it doesn't mean that I'm apolitical just because I see, just because I critique um, stuff that has historically not been critiqued. I mean, I think there's a problem with when a lot of, with minorities tend to say, well, so many other people say bad things about us, so we cannot ever say anything bad about ourselves. Um, that's the problem people had with, with School Days, Spike Lee's movie. They said, how can you say that to people? What do you think people are going to think about us? The important thing now, I think, is to say, uh, we don't care what anybody else thinks. We care about um, ourselves, and we're so self-confident that we are going to call a spade a spade. We're going to make fun of um, things that deserve to be made fun of. Um, nothing sacred, and I think that's important. If you if things if you're going to get better, um, if your art's going to improve, you need to critique it. Also, I'm proud of being a black writer. I mean, I don't see it as a limiting adjective. I don't see it as uh, like the Special Olympics. And special, we know special means handicapped. I see it just black writers like saying, it's on, one, on the one hand it's like saying a left-handed writer. It doesn't mean anything about your, your work. Um, on the other hand, if you want to lump me in with Ralph Ellison and Ishmael Reed and John A. Williams, um, I'm honored. If you want to lump me in with Gilbert Sorrentino and William Gaddis and Stanley Elkin, I'm, I'm equally honored. Tell me about the romantic impulse that rears its head in the novel occasionally, as in the Rockefeller Center scene. Um, 
I, I'm a hopeless romantic. That's true. Um, I, as I was writing the book, I didn't have a girlfriend. I desperately wanted one, so I invented, you know, several love interests in, in different storylines in the book. Um, you know, purely fantastical, I mean, not based, loosely based on all the girls I've ever gone out with to, you know, when they were old enough to be called women. I mean, it, uh, but it was really, there was a whole book of memory, and I think that's why it, it sort of works in the book. Since I wrote it overseas, and I had nothing, I couldn't just look out my window and describe what I was looking at. I had to close my eyes and, and remember and invent. And I think that, um, you know, I'd like to write that way, always. Sunset on Fifth Avenue. Buildings smolder orange, windows burn softly, hot pretzels and roasting foreign meats punctuate every corner. At Rockefeller Center, beneath that gold leaf colossus that soars over all skaters everywhere, he kneels before her, delicately tightening her pretty white skates. Around they go, she ice dancing, touching her toes or lifting back a leg, never exerting, floating, while he, knees warily bent, hands spastic flailings, steps to the bronze rail and pulls himself along. She, smiling impishly, circles behind him and pushes him faster and faster, faster still, around the rink. He leans into her, joyful terror claims his face. His legs cross down, the couple goes, a shock, then exchange glances, then lovely bubbly, bubbly giggles, and an ice flake on her nose, dissolving. And in the non-comic passages, there's a lot of detail. How did you develop your eye for detail and descriptive prose? Since the book is called Platitudes, I hate cliched ways of description. Um, I, like, I hate like his you know, steely eyes or something. He doesn't say anything anymore, even though the first person who said it said a lot. The second person said a little bit. By now, if I say it, it means nothing. So I'd have to, it took a long time to write, so I'd have to stop every time I got to an adjective. And every time I would sort of write down the, the, the cliched way and think, what is the cliche really saying? Try to turn it on its head. Um, try to make it alliterative or consonants or assonance, somehow more poetic. Um, and it's just, it's just my device of, of, uh, of observation. Well, let's take, for instance, the description of the girls leaving the Catholic school, St. Rita's, in uh, Platitudes. To create a scene like that, would you watch such a scene and take notes? I mean, do you walk around with a sketch pad of, no. of sorts? Again, I was in Italy. Um, it, all, it had always struck me that it was weird that Catholic school girls wore such short skirts. I mean, thankfully weird, I guess. Um, and I just closed my eyes and started, you know, I just saw them, made them up, saw them, and described what I saw on the inside of my eyelids. From St. Rita's School for Girls, the young women flood, then dribble out the imposing and ornate Gothic gates. Their kilts short, their socks tall, their loafers brown, their blouses yellow or white. From way up here, they always look like little candies, delicate balls of assorted deliciousness. In one group of four, walking arm in arm in etc., the prettiest is dark brown and semi-sweet, Dorothy and Friends in The Wizard of Oz. At the corner, from deep inside, their jumbo athletic jackets leaves a tunnel well after their fingertips. Packs of cigarettes appear and are passed around. Ponytails are freed and shaken tangled. Dorothy lays her baron's guide to the PSAT on the sidewalk before her, bending over but knees ever locked. Her friends also bend and stretch, press the sidewalk with their palms, pull up legs extending to pointed feet high above their heads. Obviously, they are dancers. When the limousine arrives, they quickly snap their cigarettes onto West 90th Street. And though it is now out of sight, I see the long car stopping on 96th, where Dorothy pecks her affluent friends, steps out, then down the subway stairs and into a filthy uptown train. You were born in 1962. How is your experience as a black American different than that of older black writers? What's different about my generation is that we have a much more broad-based experience. The black experience for us is anything. Um, whereas 200 years ago, the black experience was very specific to 
uh, either large or small plantations throughout the Mid-South and the Deep South. Now the black experience can be everything from Tracy Chapman um, as a black folk singer going to prep school to my friend Vernon Reed and it's a black uh, heavy metal guitarist to Fishbone as an LA based um, black punk band. Um, and all of us are equally black as, a, as a, the black kid who's still in, uh, in Natchez, Mississippi and still doesn't have any shoes. And you know, he's still uh, you know, a sharecropper's son. Well, you've spent a lot of your life in basically white worlds. Uh, so one would expect that you would be an outsider in, in the, the majority black world as well as in that white world. I mean, it, but it doesn't seem that that's the case. No, I think that's, that's basically true. Um, again, in, the, in that new black aesthetic that I, I, I always harp on, the, um, I'd say that people like myself were alienated from both the black worlds, the traditional black world, and the white world. So from that sort of cult of alienation, um, you get this weird, I wouldn't call it even a hybrid, just a, 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 an aberration. And so what, what's interesting though is that there are, there are thousands and thousands of blacks who grew up just like me, which I didn't even know growing up. I didn't know anybody like me until I went to Stanford. Um, and even then there were just a few. And then when I came to New York and as you get in a circle of sort of weird black kids, um, you find that all of them and all of us have grown up in similar ways. So I say, you know, like, like twins separated at birth, all these, uh, we thought we were only children. And it's, it's, it's exciting now, now here in New York. Um, and I think that's where you see Vernon and, and uh, myself and, and my friend Reggie Hudlin, who's a filmmaker, and George Wolfe, a playwright, um, doing really interesting work. Um, and I get letters from people um, all the time saying, I didn't think that anybody else grew up the way I did. I felt that I was alone, and that's, that's, not, a, you know, that's not pleasant. So right now, as we come into our 20s and see and finally find other people like ourselves, it's, um, it's exciting. So what are the characteristics of the new black aesthetic as you define it? Um, basically, they are black kids my age. Um, some of them are what I call cultural mulattoes, meaning that, like myself, they grew up in white neighborhoods, but they are as black as anybody else. The way a mulatto might have black and white parents, but are still black and is, you know, legally and culturally, not le culturally, but legally and spiritually, I think, as black as, as a as a Ugandan. Um, there's that one component. The other component is just a, a, a young black artist who's not, who has this, what Greg Tate, who's a, who's a friend of mine and a, voice, a village voice critic calls, a post-liberated aesthetic. Um, since we grew up after the civil rights movement, um, where our parents tried so hard to um, exercise the, the slave mentality out of us, um, we come out with a new cockiness, uh, we're self-assured, um, the slave mentality, as it were, is, is basically eradicated. So um, we're strong, I think, stronger in a way than, than they were thanks to them, and you know, purely thanks to them. Read the following passage, then answer the questions based on a foundation grounded in what you have read. One of the most charming and endearing of the many humorous anecdotes to come out of the civil rights era concerns a certain Georgia church deacon, one of those fiery, uncompromising few who symbolized the struggle to make old Jim Crow take wing and fly from this land of the free. It seems that his town's major department store diners and restaurants continued to refuse to serve Afro-Americans, even though similar changes had already been made all over the South in the wake of the now legendary boycotts and sit-ins. Well, that firebrand of a man, Deacon Blank, took it upon himself to rally the hard-working Afro-American community to boycott every downtown store until they, quote, changed their tune. The town's level of tension was at an all-time high. The Deacon, who did not own an automobile himself, valiantly and effectively organized those in the Afro-American community with vehicles to drive the 50 miles to newly integrated Macon to buy all their dry goods and sundries. After two weeks of the boycott, the deacon was called to meet the town's Caucasian elders. Three hours later, the deacon emerged and told his loyal and good-natured trusting flock, 
brethren, who wants to eat at their old smelly lunch counters anyway? Shoot, I wouldn't eat their old smelly food even if you promised me the key to the gates of heaven itself. Let us all go home and forget all this talk about boycotts. We'll fight them old white folks when it's really important. And the funny end of the story came one month later, when the stores did change their Jim Crow policy without seeming to bow to Afro-American pressure. And that fiery stalwart, the deacon, well, he won a brand new soft blue Cadillac convertible in the Chamber of Commerce's first annual Negro Car Lottery. Question 1. The tone of the narrative is A. Jocular B. Bitingly sarcastic C. Caustic or D. Conversational Question 2. The deacon is described as A. Fiery B. Corrupt C. Valiant or D. All of the above Question 3. The most precise title for this passage is A. Glory, one chapter in the struggle or B, the deacon's new car, C, shameless, the buying of deacon blank, or D, free at last, I won't be taking no bus no more. Question four. In line 17, integrated means A, your daughter can now marry anyone, B, improved, C, Afro-Americans have no more excuses, or D, all of the above. Funds for the preceding program were provided by the literature programs of the National Endowment for the Arts and the New York State Council on the Arts, and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is PBS.